I have a story I saved from last year I think. It was from an ex-Royal Marine, everything is written from his point of view. I've frequented X for a few months now, but have been coming to 4chan in general since 09. I was in the Royal Navy, British, for 13 years, serving as a Royal Marine. The story I'm going to share with you was experienced by myself and mates I served with. There are various details of the story I have to leave out due to legal constraints, most of this still isn't open to the public. It starts in June 2004. I've just been given notice I'm to do a two-week stint serving on the HMS Lancaster for specialist duties the next day. During my career I was trained in specialist diving techniques and have done a lot maritime training with the SBS lads a lot of the ops I'm sent on involve some sort of diving or at least some underwater element to them. When I press my co for more details on what I'll be doing on a shitty little frigate for two weeks, he tells me not to ask and just go, I'll be told everything when I get there. So I eventually get on the HMS Wongston at Portsmouth. I'm met by two SBS lads one of which I know. Let's call them Frank and Eddie, Frank being the one I know. Both are pretty big lads and can easily handle themselves. One look will tell you that they've been through hard times. We get ourselves sorted and the frigate leaves. We sit down for dinner and I ask them if they know anything about what we'll be doing, they were given the same orders I was. All they know is it's a waterborne op somewhere in UK waters. The actual location is non-disclosable, but I can tell you it was off the coast of Scotland. That evening we're given a briefing by a naval intelligence officer. We'll call him Craig. Craig tells us where we are going and what we'll be doing for the two weeks, which includes conducting underwater reconnaissance of volcanically active seabeds caves. This sounds like BS to the three of us straight away. It doesn't take a specialist Royal Marine diver and two maritime counter-terrorism operatives to poke around some caves. We voice our concerns, but Craig insists it's a routine study of possibly seismologically and volcanically active underwater terrain. We don't press the matter, but something is definitely up. We arrive at the target locale and get all our scuba gear on. We're given these little instruments that tread CO2 levels in the water. We are to look for concentrated points on a patch of seabed we were tasked with checking. We have comms to the frigate and must stay in constant contact. We go below the surface and make our way down to the seabed. It's not far, about 25 meters. We begin a methodical sweep of the bed and communicate CO2 readouts back to the Lancaster. After about 10 minutes, we don't find any readouts that we consider to be significantly high, and the Lancaster directs us to a different patch. The terrain goes down a little, about 30 to 35 meters below the surface. Light is pretty poor, and we have to use these clunky underwater torsed strapped to our wetsuits. We searching around for a couple of minutes before we begin to get an uneasy feeling, like we shouldn't really be there. I stop and look around, Frank is doing the same like he feels it too. We talk a little, mostly to calm ourselves down. Eddie continues to do the readouts over our conversations. Suddenly he stops mid-readout, but keeps his comms line open. He's clearly distressed by something. We swim over to him, asking him if he's okay. We get to him and literally stop mid-swim. My body goes completely and immediately cold, like someone flicked a switch. In front of Eddie is the rotting, bloated, disfigured corpse of a grown man. He's been tied down to the bottom of the seabed and has chunks of himself missing. His face is disfigured, his throat is cut open, his belly is torn, and his intestines are hanging out. He's completely naked, and his penis has a large spike hammered into it. We just hang there, bobbing up and down off the seabed for about 10 seconds, taking it in. Frank moves his hand to the pressel underneath his wetsuit and opens his calm line with the frigate. He tells them what we found. There's not an immediate reply and we wait for a few seconds before Craig comes over the net. He tells us to retrieve the body and bring it back to the O frigate, which is what we do. We were all pretty quiet that night. The body was slumped onto a trolley and was led away by Craig, the frigate's commander, whose name escapes me now and a small group of guys. We didn't see the body again and when we asked if they'd identified the man, Craig brushed us off. 
We know the man was identified, again, cannot disclose, and we believe the body was taken back to mainland UK. Eddie was clearly still affected by the ordeal the day afterwards. Again, we were sent into the abyss and told we would now be searching a formation of underwater caves nearby to where we found the body. Our search began pretty normally, except for the readouts. We'd been the idea that we were there to check CO2 levels and confronted Craig. He dropped the story and told us this area was a hotspot for marine life activity not yet documented. We asked if it was in any way linked to the body we found which, again, he brushed off. After this, we point blank refused to go down there unarmed, and we were given spring-loaded harpoons that could easily kill a man at 10 meters. I've used them before and know from experience these are lethal. We enter the caves and detect an immediate drop in temperature. The caves are pretty straightforward, just one large cavern after another. We search around for about five minutes before anything happens. We are about to enter from one cavern into another through a small opening in a rock face when we hear a high-pitched shriek from deep within the caverns. Because it's underwater it's muffled and sounds like a gargling screech, but it's still clearly audible. We all freeze and look between each other. We wait about a minute before we hear it again. It echoes off the cavern's walls and bounces around, making it hard to judge in which particular direction it's coming from. Frank opens comms with the Lancaster and reports what we've just heard. Craig comes onto the net again and asks if we've had any visual contact. Frank tells him we haven't, and he comes back telling us to explore further and find evidence of the creature that made the sound. We stare unbelieving at each other. We're pretty rough blokes who have been through the wars, those two especially, but fuck are we shitting ourselves. We reluctantly swim on into the next cavern, harpoons pointed forward, fingers on triggers. It's plain to all of us that this isn't a naturally formed cavern. The walls are too smooth, and there's pillar-like structures at regular intervals along the sides of the cavern. We explore further and then find what appears to be markings along the walls of the cavern, like cave paintings or hieroglyphs. They're hard to make out, but they show underwater humanoid-like creatures, something one might describe as a mermaid. There is out markings on the wall that resemble some form of written language, symbols appearing often, marked in a structured format etc. We're about halfway through the cavern when we hear the shriek again, only closer this time. Seconds afterwards it's met by another, longer, and higher pitched shriek that sounds nearer to us. We stop and scan the cavern. Our torches are strong and easily illuminate the entire cavern and show multiple entrance slash exits. Eddie, to my left, begins to flail about, he shoots his harpoon, which fees through the water hitting the ceiling of the cavern. Me and Frank turn to look at him and see blood leaking from his arm. He's holding it and watching something with white eyes. I follow his gaze and see a small figure dart through one of the holes in the cavern. We ask him if he's okay and what happened. He's breathing heavily and pleads with us to leave. We don't need much convincing and begin to leave. As we are exiting, shrieks begin to ring throughout the caves, too many for us to count, like a swarm of the fuckers. We begin to panic and swim out of there as fast as we fucking can. Images of the man we found tear through my head. We exit the cave and swim as fast as our legs will take us to the surface. The shrieks died away as we left the caves, but we don't slow down. We break the surface and scramble onto the deck. We drop our scuba kit and rip off our goggles. Craig comes out to meet us, asking us what happened. Frank loses his shit and almost decks the guy. Eddie calls a medic over to take a look at his arm. He cuts off the arm of his wetsuit to reveal bite marks on his forearm. I turn to Craig who is still getting a bullocking from Frank. He holds up his hands and tells him to calm down. This fires up Frank even more. I step in and tell Frank to go help Eddie. Craig strides off back into the hull of the frigate. By this time practically the whole crew of 130 are out on deck to check out what's going on. Later that evening Craig calls us into the briefing room. He tells us the op's been cancelled and we are returning to Portsmouth. Eddie was given a tetanus shot and his arm was wrapped in bandages, he made a full recovery. I never saw Craig again, 
and I left the Royal Navy a year later three years after I left the Navy I bumped into Frank whilst in Bournemouth for a weekend. We went out and got a drink and talked about it all again. He told me that since then the Royal Navy had been conducting exploratory operations in the area we were and he personally knew some of the lads they were using on a regular basis to continue with the searches for the marine life not yet documented. Eddie had got out as well and was working for the Blackwater Private Security Company. He'd tried speaking to him about what attacked him that time, but he's very reserved about it and doesn't like to discuss it. We never did find out exactly what it was, but we do know there is nothing like it that science knows of. I've since had visits from various different naval and army intelligence personnel to discuss with me what I saw and the importance of keeping this strictly under wraps. This is the first time I've publicly disclosed this information, including to my family and close friends. I imagine I'm going to be getting a visit in the morning by some less than savory characters, but at least I didn't say the really secret stuff. I do value my life, after all. N. Still one of my favorites, haven't seen a post from him since though. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe.